Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. And amen. All right, all right. How are we doing, everybody? How are you doing? Okay, you all ready for this? Uh, hey, gr- grab your Bible and go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 12. We're going to get there in a moment. Um, everybody's nervous. We're talking about politics, all right? But you're going to see a little different direction. We're calling it the politics of Jesus. Um, a study that I saw recently, one third of U.S. adults have had an argument with a friend about politics recently. Um, college graduates are more likely, 50% more likely, to have a, an argument with a friend about politics. Now, about two-thirds of you haven't had an argument at all because you don't have any friends. Um, and that's, that's, I made that up, that's not part of the study. Um, but, interestingly, 47% of all Clinton supporters don't know anyone who's voting for Trump. 31% of all Trump voters are, 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 uh, are those who are, are voting for him. Uh, they don't know anyone who's voting for Hillary Clinton. And that's what happens, isn't it? We find ourselves in our own place, our own space, and we don't often uh, hear other sides or enter into conversation, really, with people. And before you get really nervous about this series, you know, we're not going to endorse some candidate. You know, I'm not going to tell you all about who to vote for. But we are going to help you, guide you, perhaps in decision making, uh, biblically. But we're, we're especially going to help you understand how to engage uh, culture in this kind of cultural moment we find ourselves in. Scripture speaks to that, and we're going to look at the defining, one of the defining passages that Jesus gives us, teachings around uh, the place of government and how, we're to, how we are to respond and, 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 and stay engaged. We've said that it's not uh, fight or flight, it's salt and light. In other words, you know, a lot of times we approach uh, the political arena or discussions like this and we just come out of anger. I mean, we kind of model after some kind of cable news something where they just go point counterpoint and they just start going off on each other and, and, and nobody's really talking. Uh, nobody's really listening. And I say that a lot of people are talking, very little listening. And so there's really no consensus. There's no, there's no sense of seeking to understand the other side. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Jesus is going to help us. We've said that it's not fight, but it's not flight either. We don't run from, but we, we, we stay in the game. Jesus shows us a third way. The gospel is always a third way. It's not religion. It's not irreligion. It's not even something in between. It's something altogether different. And so we're going to see what he says here today about the role of government and then our response to it. So we're going to talk about rendering to Caesar. You've heard that phrase, to render to Caesar what Caesar, Caesar's and to God what's God's. And we, this is out of this passage today. So we're looking to see how do we live as citizens in heaven while residents on earth? All right, so let's, let's jump in. What do you say? Look at Mark chapter 12. This story, by the way, uh, is in all three of the synoptic gospels. You may know that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Sin means, S-Y-N, is, is together, all right? Optic means to see, right? So to see together, a lot of the same stories, not all, but some of the same stories, and we see them from different angles. So I'm saying that because we've got more to the story than is here in Mark. Mark is probably more concise than Matthew or the others. But check this out, verse 13, um, just to place this in context. This is after the triumphal entry. This is Passion Week. So he knows what's coming, and he's speaking boldly. His authority is being challenged. He's not yet been, a, you know, been arrested. Uh, he's, he's creating some noise in the city as he's come uh, triumphantly, or I should say on a donkey, People are wondering, what kind of king is this? And this comes into play. The key question that the leaders are asking is, are you a revolutionary? And if you are, what kind of revolutionary are you? So we're going to see that Jesus finds himself really in a dangerous position. Look at verse 13. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees, all right, and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. 
Now, I want to stop there for a minute because the other gospel writers tell us that uh, in more detail, they, they, you can imagine, they had the meeting before the meeting. You know, there's always the meeting before the meeting. But these are very interesting allies here. It was uh, Charles Dudley Warner. He was an essayist, um, writer. He was a friend, actually, of Mark Twain. He's the one who said, politics makes strange bedfellows. These two groups are not friendly to one another. They disagree with one another greatly. They don't agree on much of anything, but they have a common enemy in Jesus. So they come together, which is really interesting. I think a lot of people vote that way, by the way. We have a common enemy. Let's just vote for this person, not them. Regardless of who this person is, we're not voting for them. And that's where some of us fall in regard to you know, our political party or how we're going to make decisions uh, not only in the days to come, but in, in the years to come. I want to challenge our thinking a little bit. So I want you to see who these groups are, because this is very important to understand this passage. First, you have the Herodians. Now, the, the Herodians, though they were Jews, they were more of a political group than a religious group. That's important to, to consider. Th these are really two political groups that are coming to Jesus, and they have the question for him that they think they've come up with. They went to a committee meeting together. They came together, and they said, we think we've got a, a question, and either way he answers it, he's in trouble. And you're going to see that here in a moment. But it's important that we understand the groups. Herodians, uh, they are pro-government. In fact, uh, they are, um, they're, they're supporters of Herod Antipas. That's the son of the great uh, Herod the Great. They're, he's placed there by Rome. He's like a governor. He's a tetrarch. So he's a, there's four of them. And he's kind of a governor over this region. And, and so uh, they were very much um, in favor of, of Rome and all things uh, political. Then you have the Pharisees who are on the other side of this coin, if you will, a, a Jewish religious political group distinguished by, as you know, strict observance of the Torah. They were opposed to the Roman government in every way. Uh, they didn't think you ought to pay taxes to Rome. Now, you know that this is a pretentious, prideful religious group, but they're very much a political group. And they would be against government saying if you pay taxes to Rome, it's heresy. Because, as we'll see, on the coin itself, their coin, had a picture of the Caesar uh, who, who uh, was Tiberius. Tiberius was the son of Augustus, and he was divine, all right? They claimed that he was God, and they were to worship him as a god, if you will. And, of course, you know, the Jews had nothing to do with that. It's why, it's why Zacchaeus was so hated. Remember, he was, he was a tax collector. He was a Jewish tax collector, and so they hated him because he was a traitor, and so they based this claim on the fact that, that we, on the Roman coin, there was the image of Caesar. Now, they would pay the temple tax. It's the only tax that they wanted to pay because it was paid in Jewish shekels. And they, they, uh, they gained from that tax a bit. So this trap, you're going to see, seems inescapable between these two groups. Let's go on. Look at the question they come with. And they came to him and they said to him, this is interesting, Teacher, Rabbi, we know that you are true. How about that? We know you speak the truth. And do not care about, uh, about anyone's opinion. Isn't that great? Wouldn't you like to have a leader like that? For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Wow. They just described someone that we all might want to vote for. I've already voted for Jesus, by the way. I think a lot of us have, right? Uh, he is king. And we're going to talk about that today. Is, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? This word pay in the Greek is didomi. It means to pay, literally, like to pay something. This comes into play. They use this word twice. But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, look at this. They asked the question, is it, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus says, why, why are you putting me to the test? I mean, immediately he challenged their motivation. He doesn't answer the question immediately. He says, what, what do you guys, what do you think you're doing here? I know what you're doing. I know why you're asking the question. And, and then he says, bring me a denarius. And you just saw a picture of it there. Bring me a denarius. Let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness or image, the word in the Greek is icon, and inscription is this. They said to him, well, it's Caesar's. Jesus said to them, 
Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. That word means they, they were astonished, greatly amazed by him. Now, you've got to understand the nature of this question and the nature of his answer to see why were they so amazed. This word render in verse 17 is not didomi, pay. This word means to pay back. It's to, it's to pay back someone something they actually deserve. So he's saying, pay back to Caesar what is his. Pay back to God what he deserves. Now, I want us to really unpack this. This is an amazing teaching here if we fully understand it. The trap seems, in, seems inescapable, and here's why. If he says, yes, pay taxes to Caesar, then, then this is religious heresy. The Jews would... would, would Dismiss him immediately. If he says, no, don't pay taxes, then he becomes a zealot, a radical revolutionary, and the Romans are after him. Okay, so the, Her the Herodians on that side are, are saying, whoa, 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 whoa. But Jesus, again, he shows a third way. I want you to see this coin again. This coin has a Latin inscription on it, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, is what this says, on the coin's perimeter. On the opposite side was a picture of a Roman goddess there. You can see sitting there. This is um, Pax, the, the, the god of peace, if you will. You heard, you've heard of Pax Roma, Roma uh, Roman peace, peace of Rome. It says there, high priest... Uh, on there, this Latin inscription. So you see there's this king, God, or divine, and high priest on the coin, is what it says. This is why the Jews had such trouble with it. It's why Jesus would say, okay, um, let's render to Caesar what's Caesar's, but let's render to God what's God's. Now it's interesting, intriguing, that he doesn't really uh, tell us what the scope of our giving is. What do we give? What are, we, what are we rendering to Caesar? You could say, well, yeah, he is the tax. Okay, that's part of it. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. What, what else do we give to government? What do we give to political leaders, if you will? What do we render to them, pay back to them what they deserve? But the greater question that we're going to land on is, he doesn't, he doesn't tell us, what are the things of God? And we're going to ultimately get there because what Jesus is talking about here, more than politics, he's talking about the very nature of his identity, and he's ultimately talking about worship. And that's where all of this goes. So first, I want you to see there's three things. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. We're talking about the politics of Jesus. First, I want you to refuse political simplicity. And then we're going to talk about the second one, reject political hostility, even animosity on the part of some. And then thirdly, replace Political idolatry. All right. So what happens here? Jesus says, "All right, reject political sympathy, uh, simplicity, uh, reject political primacy, and reject political complacency." Even so, we're going to break it down this way, though. First, refuse political simplicity. All right. N.T. Wright, uh, the great Anglican theologian, he says this: Jesus does not say answer yes or no. He answers both. Tim Keller said it this way. He says, when, G, when, when asked about our, our relationship with God, Jesus gives a simple answer. He always gives a simple answer. But when asked about politics, he doesn't give a simple answer. And, and, and so he, he both resists what's on the coin and accepts what's on the coin. So the icon, uh, the, the coin represents the kingdom of this world. And Jesus points us, though, to another. He doesn't dismiss the kingdom of the world, but he, but he points us to another kingdom. He's going to say, ultimately, in this answer, he's saying, I am a revolutionary, but not the kind you think I am. And that's the entire you know, problem with the leaders of his day. This past week, I was at um, a clergy mobilization meeting. Uh, pastor Brian Carter, our friend at Concord Church, and I were leading a, a group of pastors from around the city. We've been doing this since the shooting on Ju uh, July 7th. And we've been coming together, black and white pastors from across the city, to really say, hey, what are next steps? And what does true repentance look like? What, is, what does true unity look like in the body of Christ? So we're pointing all these pastors towards some events that are upcoming, Pulpit Swap and Transform Dallas that we're all going to be part of and really leading the way. And you need to know our church is leading the way for the city right now. And it is a beautiful thing. But I can tell you that in that room, 
There are pastors. We, we were all, and this is what's beautiful, we're all united around Christ and Him alone for the common good of the city. Uh, and and there were, we, didn't, we don't talk about politics. There's none of that. We did honor the mayor, who's been an incredible leader through this, by the way. But Pastor and Car- Carter and I had this opportunity to really bless the mayor, honor him, and thank him for his leadership during this time. We've heard from the chief who's come to talk to us as well. But this group, my point is, is united around Christ. But I can tell you, because I've had some conversations with different ones, you could have a couple of pastors in this room who would come together if they were to talk about politics, all right? Uh, and some of them, from, even from the same denomination, so very similar theology, could come together, talk about uh, politics, and really listen well. Seek to understand the other. And they would end the conversation by saying, I, I do not understand. I cannot believe that someone who loves Jesus would vote for your candidate on both sides. You know, and right now the polls are telling us some kind of 50-50 thing going on here. Uh, here's what I want us to do. you got to step back at least, enter into the conversation. If it's 50-50, you might be wrong. You might be wrong. Very few of us come come to this conversation with that kind of a posture. Very few of us. So what what do we look for in a president? Think about that. Remember, we're not voting for pastor-in-chief. We're voting for commander-in-chief. So I get that. Um, You have a pastor. You know, we have pastors. You would hold me to high standards in regard to integrity and Humility and prayer and, and, and pursuing Christ with my life. And you should hold me to that. But what do we look for in leaders? The Bible's very clear. Scripture teaches us that great leaders are humble. They're honest. They're wise. They seek wise counsel. They're generally consensus builders. They, they have unique humility because they're not seeking what's best for them But even at great personal cost, they're seeking what's best for the organization or the church or, in this case, um, the country. And we need to demand these things from our leaders. We must demand that our leaders are morally upright. So here's where I'm going to get in trouble. Because a lot of you are saying, man, I wish we had a leader like that. Right? I wish we had that kind of character in our political leaders. But instead, on Friday, we we discover this video and and we we hear these words that come from uh, Donald Trump. And I can tell you, as as a father of girls and a man who loves his wife, those words are vile and grotesque. And they ought to upset every one of us in this room. And and you don't have to say, oh, but no, wait, 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 what about Clinton? What about Clinton, though? No, you can just land there and end there. Now, on the other side, okay, sorry, but the day before, we find out that that Clinton has private positions and public positions. My point is that, that I'm reminded of John Wooten, the great basketball coach. He's the one who said, integrity is what you do when no one is watching. It's what you say when nobody's watching. Or in our day, when you think nobody's watching. Right? So my point is this. We should demand. I don't care what side you're on of this thing. We ought to demand that our leaders have integrity and moral backbone. I've heard Republicans argue for, for, you know, from the stance of, like, you know, the Ten Commandments, even, for abortion or marriage or from Scripture, freedom of religion, immigration. I've heard, I've heard Democrats argue from biblical perspective as well. Jesus was a, was a health care dispensing machine. <laughs> Free. <laughs> I mean, I've heard that, for real. And then to argue that surely Jesus would welcome the alien. You know, when it comes to immigration, again, don't, you don't need to send me emails. I'm, all right, come on. I'm, I'm just telling you. I'm challenging you. We, we must vote, not simply. This is not simple, is my point. But prayerfully and biblically, 
Reject political simplicity is really the point here. Uh, in 2012, 126 million people voted. Uh, 38 million Christians did not vote. 12 million Christians not even registered. And uh, just point of application today, we're gonna ha- we have a table out in the commons uh, where you can, you can register. You can go ask questions if you're not. We want to help you. We want you to be engaged, be involved. All right? We're not going to give you a voter's guide. We're not going to tell you who to vote for. We're going to just help you if you're not yet registered. So find, uh, find them out in the commons afterwards. All right, so first, refuse political simplicity. Secondly, reject political hostility. All right? Even at times, again, animosity. The Pharisees had a hostile relationship with the Roman government. And I just want to encourage you, again, if we just kind of model after what we see on cable news, um, you know, it's, it's going to be challenging. We can love, we can enter into conversation. James says it this way, James 1.19, you know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. I don't see a lot of that in political conversations. Listen, if as a Christian, your politics are comfortable with anger, with anger and belittling and name calling, there is a disconnect between your walk with Christ and your political engagement. If, if, if you, if you uh, or politics, I should say, invoke anger or hatred towards a particular candidate, or towards those who support that candidate, there's a disconnect between, between your walk with Christ and your political views and engagement that, that may not express the fruit of the Spirit. I want you to test your own heart. Test your own spirit. Ephesians 4.29, it says this, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. All right, so we need to be more, poli- more biblical than we, than we are Republican or Democrat. Jesus doesn't take the, sides of the Pharisee, side of the Pharisees. And in so doing, he's saying, let's not be hostile in our relationship with government. Now, thirdly, replace political idolatry. I want to land here. This is the Herodians. All right, So do we obey Caesar? Do we not? Jesus, are you a revolutionary? Yes and no. Again, I'm a revolutionary, but not the kind you think I am. I'm unlike any revolutionary you've ever seen. Jesus will not allow us to be polarized. Uh, He says, get in the game. Stay in the game. But many of us, like God's people in the Old Testament, a lot of us want a king. We want a king who will do our bidding and ultimately meet all of our needs that we have. And this is where the Herodians were. We, many of us, listen, the problem in America is that the church has for too long uh, opted for another king or even co-opted with government so that we might ultimately uh, accomplish all that we think we need to accomplish. And you never see, I've I've said it before, can you imagine Jesus or even Paul wringing their hands just so anxious, so fearful, just hoping that we get our guy on the throne in Rome as emperor or we will never see the kingdom of God advance. You never see that. I mean, that's crazy talk, really. And in conversations, you know, that we've had with our police chief where we're demanding that government or or the police department do all things. Keep us safe, but don't hurt any of us. Uh, Raise our kids would be good. You know, solve this racial tension, end poverty, clean up our neighborhoods. See, a lot of us, the problem is that that many of us today have been placing our ultimate hope in government. And I just want to encourage you, you know, your anxiety, your anger, I've talked about this before, maybe your obsession over certain things political, it's sending the wrong message. And and I want to say this to, to folks who are, you know, about my age or so, 45 or 50 or older, your, your conversation, your, the way you talk about politics, your anxiety, your anger, even hostility towards particular candidates, listen, you're scaring the kids, all right? Stop. You're scaring the kids. And you're teaching the kids, you're teaching our children 
That if we, again, that we don't trust the Lord who is king. So I suppose express what you think. And we should, and again, I'm, I'm, I've noted earlier, we should call out leaders that are not, you know, godly or at least morally upright leaders. We can talk to our kids about that. But always point them to the fact that there is already a king who's already in charge. And that, that politics is not the ultimate end. It's really interesting, this word icon, image, whose image is on the coin. Uh, Because we all, each of us, have been created in the image of God. And we serve a Savior who is the exact representation of God in the flesh, Christ our Lord. So I want to land with this uh, interesting uh, truth that I came across in this passage, and then implications to come, and then we'll close our time in prayer. Interesting, I noted earlier that Jesus doesn't give us the scope of the things uh, that we're to give. Uh, Now, again, it's it's taxes. We're to pay taxes. Uh, We're to to give back to our government uh, what's due our government. We're to be um, good citizens, right? But he doesn't tell us or give us the answer as to what belongs to God. What do we give to God? And I think what's going on here, he's, he's challenging the Herodians and the Pharisees and us, listen, to answer the question. He says, give to God what's God's. It begs the question, well, what, what's God's? The answer would be, anybody? Everything. And I think that's what he's getting to. What's God? If he's God, really God, he owns everything. And watch this. Even Caesar, he owns him. And everything that Caesar has, God already owns, right? And so so the question that we have here is, is a challenging one, and he doesn't give us the answer. And I think it's because he wants each of us, this is where this lands today. What is it that you have that you've not given over to God? Does he own you? Ultimately is where that goes. If he owns everything, then you have nothing, and everything we have belongs to him. I love that. So everything belongs to God. The things that are Caesar's, you give to Caesar, but they are derivative. That is to say, they, they are, they are an, uh, they're copied. They're likened to. So when we give to Caesar, we're giving to God. Because all that that God's given to us, he owns, and he owns Caesar himself. It's why Jesus, in his conversation that he'll have with Pilate on this week, you might remember this, he says this. Pilate says to him, why will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you or crucify you? Your life is in my hands, Jesus. And then Jesus says to him, you have no authority over me. At all, unless it has been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has a greater sin. Listen, friends, listen. If Trump or Clinton becomes president, it will only be because God himself has given them that authority. Now, I know that gets a little wonky because we're wondering, well, aren't we supposed to vote for the... Yes. But he's sovereign over all the... Yes. This is why we can rest in him. We can trust him. Like in all things in life, we pursue him, we obey him, and we trust him with the rest. Always focusing on Christ alone. What happens when government tells us to do something that is unbiblical? What if we're told that we can't share the gospel, for instance? Well, Scripture tells us that too. Acts chapter 5, Peter says, the other disciples answered, So, hey, we ought to obey God rather than man. See, Caesar's claim and his power is limited. And and if it goes past where it should be and it comes into the realm of God, then uh, we, we end up, we're going with God. If we're told to do something that's explicitly unbiblical. Romans 13, you know the passage perhaps, everyone must submit himself to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which is from God. The authorities that exist have been appointed by God. So listen, God is not shaken by this political season. And you've noted here, uh, Jesus is not running this, this month. You know why? 
because he's already won. Jesus is not running because he's already king. And he's king over the entire world, the whole universe. And the question, it comes down to this, is he king of your life? Is he Lord of your life? He's not running because he's already in charge. And he's in charge of the hearts of men and women, boys and girls who would give their lives over to him. Listen, don't miss this. The most powerful person in the world today is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he is sovereign over us, and he alone demands our lives. So isn't it interesting here? How does this kingdom come? If you're a revolutionary of a different kind of revolution, different kind of kingdom, how does it come? Well, isn't it interesting? These folks with all power, uh, it, seemingly, or they, they, you know, they were in positions of power and comfort, success, recognition. These are characteristics of the kingdom of the world. And Jesus took all of these things on himself. This is a king without a quarter. Did you catch that? Anybody got a quarter? I don't have one. I got nothing. They had to bring him a quarter. This is the upside down kingdom. This is our great king. So as we think about decision 2016, choose whom you will serve. Whom will you serve? I love Joshua who says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So I want to challenge you. Listen, if you're not a believer, you haven't received Christ, that's your decision today. He's king. Give him your life. He alone is worthy of your, of your submission. Surrender your life to him. If you're not a member of this church, I want to challenge you the most important decision you'll make. Choosing a church will be more important than choosing a candidate this month, next month. I want you to choose. If you're here in the church, I want you to choose to worship, to connect, to serve, and to multiply. Those are the decisions that we're talking about this month, okay? So I want you to bow your heads and just close your eyes with me as we land this sermon. We're going to sing together just a proclamation as we close. Listen, again, we need to refuse political simplicity. We need to reject political hostility. Check your heart in that. We need to replace political idolatry with worship of the one true king. Our complete surrender is to Christ, our king. So I'm going to ask you, have you decided to follow him? Have you given your life to him? The kingdoms of this world will fade. Nobody's talking about Tiberius today. Everybody's talking about Jesus. He is Lord. Is he Lord of your life? What do you need to say to him right now? He's listening. He knows your heart. Surrender your life to Him. Give all that you are to Him. Lord, we love you. We, we worship you. We give you our lives. I pray that each person here would be courageous to make the decisions that you're calling them to make today. And that we bow before our King all the days of our lives. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.